uh, in the previous lesson, uh, we have uh, discussed about shock uh, as well as uh, we have uh, started about uh, acute kidney injury. We have seen about uh, different causes of uh, pre-renal, uh, intra-renal, uh, or post-renal uh, causes of acute kidney injury. Uh, so today we are focusing more about the clinical presentation as well as uh, the treatment modalities of AKI. So because AKI is very common in a hospital setting, especially in the in the inpatient department, it's really very common condition. Maybe due to uncontrolled blood pressure or due to uncontrolled any other cardiovascular condition, you will see that this is really a major issue. Okay, uh, so uh, how do we categorize uh, AKI uh, based on uh, the urine output? So this category uh, is, uh, remember, uh, urine output, the normal urine output is like above uh, 1200 ml uh, per, uh, per uh, this is like per, uh, okay, let me show the highlighter, this is per day. Okay, uh, so uh, this is the, uh, the uh, category, so this is the normal output. So when you say like a patient is anuria, like there is no urine formation. Uh, uh, by the way, when you say like uh, there is no urine formation, does not mean that there is a complete absence of urine uh, production uh, by the kidney. But the amount of urine that is uh, produced per day is like very minimal. Uh, less than uh, 50 ml per day. By the way, if they want to do uh, a urine output, especially in a KI, they have to insert a catheter and monitor the urine output per day. Those are like mandatory. They have to measure input output. Those are actually uh, mandatory. Okay, uh, then when you say it is oligouria, uh, when the urine output is less than uh, 500 uh, ml per day, we can say uh, the patient is actually having a small amount of urine is uh, produced. But non oligouria uh, is above uh, uh, 500 ml, but less than uh, 1200 ml per day. So this is uh, based on the category of uh, uh, urine output. Remember, if there is a problem in the urine output, output means uh, there is something that is blocking the urine uh, passage in case of benign prostate hyperplasia, or it could be uh, there is something, uh, there is some uh, problem in the kidney, uh, especially the formation of urine. So those are very uh, good indicator uh, of renal function test. Then as I, saw, as I said in the previous lesson, urine retention is not advisable because if you retain uh, urine for a long period of time, Urine can backflow and causes uh, damage to the kidney, and we call it hydronephrosis, like a renal damage uh, due to accumulation of urine. Okay, so uh, if a patient is ha having uh, acute kidney injury, what are the basic uh, clinical uh, pictures? So uh, those are, uh, the, let's see about the clinical pictures of acute kidney injury. So if a patient is actually having AKI or acute damage, they might have edema, but the edema is not very significant as compared to like the chronic renal failure. Because this is just a sudden blockage, but of course the patient can have an edema in the extremities. Remember, uh, that is why if, if you see an edema in the lower extremities means it could be like, it could be heart failure, it could be renal problem, or it could be any other uh, condition that, uh, that affects the, the fluid balance. So you will see an edema. As a result of the edema, uh, there is a probability of uh, weight gain because uh, this patient population, they are not actually excreting uh, like any uh, significant amount of fluid from the body system in the form of urine. Because of that, uh, weight gain is very, uh, very common. Then apart from that, uh, is there anyone who came across a renal patient? For sure, most of you came across. That is my expectation. Is there anyone who came across a patient with any kidney problem? He may be chronic um, kidney damage. Yeah. Is there anyone? 
Yes. Someone said yes, but I cannot hear because of the connection issue. Stacy is saying yes. Oh, uh, Nuri, you came across? No, it's Stacy. Uh, let me use my earphone. I cannot hear. Okay, uh, can you talk right now? Now I can hear. I have come across someone with kidney disease. Okay, so maybe what is your experience? Um, there's edema. Uh -huh. Where is the edema? In the extremities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Any other? Uh, they, they, like the hands and the feet, they also become like dark and they okay. itch a lot. They itch a lot, huh? Yeah. Okay, good. Then uh, I will talk about it when we reach to uh, uh, chronic kidney disease. Huh? Any other? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay, good. Huh? I think this is really a good experience uh, you have seen. So edema is uh, very, uh, very common, but most likely uh, that patient is actually a chronic uh, kidney. Uh, how old was the patient, uh, uh, Stassi? How old was the patient? Um, late 50s. Uh, do they have any other chronic condition? Um, heart failure. Heart failure. So most likely, which one was, the, which one was uh, diagnosed first? The heart failure or the kidney failure? Heart failure. Okay, yes. So that means the heart failure leads to normally the kidney damage ultimately. So most likely uh, the, the, the kidney problem is uh, due to uh, uh, the heart failure. Okay, good. Then I will come to, uh, I will talk about uh, that condition. So uh, remember, uh, in, case of, uh, in, in case of kidney uh, failure, or in case of AKI for the timing, uh, uh, what will happen? Uh, there are uh, known as nitrogenous uh, waste products. Remember, uh, like majority of the nitrogenous waste products are very toxic. They are not eliminated from the body system. So we call them uremic toxins. Huh? Uremic, uh, uremic toxins. So those uremic toxins are very, uh, very bad. Sometimes even they can cause itching to the skin as Stasi said, eh? so uh, not only even itching and actually causing damage to the brain, and even they go to the brain and causes a uremic encephalopathy, which is very common in advanced stage of uh, 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 like uh, kidney uh, failure. So uh, apart from that, this uremic toxin can actually cause nausea and vomiting because they do have a potential to activate the vomiting center. So nausea, vomiting, and, and diarrhea is very common. And apart from that, uh, their appetite will be uh, suppressed because those toxins normally they can cause anorexia or loss of appetite. Then, as I said before, uh, the mental status change is actually uh, because of accumulation of this toxin. So this toxin can cause uh, damage of the brain and ultimately uh, the patient can have uh, uremic encephalopathy. But remember, this one is usually occur when there is very large, very excess amount of uh, creatinine in the body system. And then, uh, as a result, even because of fluid accumulation, it can cause pulmonary edema, so the patient can end up having a shortness of breath. Yeah? So this shortness of breath is actually uh, because of fluid accumulation. Remember, if the kidney is damaged, means like one of the physiological role of the kidney is regulating fluid balance. Like if the fluid is excess, it, it will excrete the excess fluid. If it is actually low, it tries to retain water so that it can actually increase at the blood volume. So uh, if there is a problem in the kidney means like excess amount of fluid will not be excreted. So the patient will end up having edema in the extremities. If there is an edema in the lung, it 
can cause shortness of breathing. Okay, uh, then as, uh, as Tati said, bronchitis is really very common, but this one you'll notice, especially in advanced stage of uh, chronic kidney failure, uh, because, uh, because of the uromic toxin. The uromic toxin normally they have a potential to cause itching. So if you notice normally by day, chronic uh, itching, uh, don't be surprised and mostly antihistamines are, are useful in the management of this itching. Yeah, but I will come to that when we are discussing about uh, CKD because it is very common in CKD. And uh, volume depletion can be occur, especially in the pre-renal uh, case, uh, and also even weight loss uh, because of like uh, because of dehydration and because of the causes. Uh, uh, volume depletion, load, weight loss is very uh, very common. Then apart from that, uh, the colic type of abdominal pain. Yeah? Uh, which is mainly in the flank areas, is very common. So uh, that is uh, very common, especially when there is uh, kidney damage. So I, I hope you know about the location of the kidney. <coughs> kidney is actually located in the lumbar region, in the right and uh, left lumbar. I, I remember I mentioned about the abdom nine abdominal region when we were discussing about uh, those uh, regions in the peace lab despite it was like short exposure. Uh, then, uh, at the result of fluid accumulation, you will see like uh, some kind of uh, increase in blood pressure and also even distension in the jugular vein. Uh, if you remember about jugular vein distension is, is, is located in the neck, so you will see this distension. Uh, Idram, I already mentioned about that. Uh, hypotension or uh, orthostatic hypotension can occur. Uh, but this one is true uh, when a patient is having uh, pre-renal uh, issues uh, and have already said about the possibility of blood distension. If there is a, an, an outlet of obstruction, uh, the patient can have uh, this uh, condition. So uh, what are the diagnostic tests that should be considered? And mostly the physician rely on the lab tests like the serum creatinine, blood urea nitrogen, and look at the the potassium level possibility of uh, metabolic acidosis is very, uh, very common. So uh, I think by the way, if you want to have a clear picture about kidney damage, you need to have some background information about the physiological role of kidney. So as much as you can, when, when you are reading uh, the kidney disorder, uh, try, to, uh, try to read about the physiological role of kidney. For example, Kidney is very important for excretion of excessive potassium, yeah, especially in the distal renal tubule. So if the patient is having kidney problem, the potassium level is very, very high. So if a patient is actually having kidney problem, even potassium rich diets such as bananas, avocados, tomatoes are not generally recommended uh, because of the risk of hyperkalemia. So you can actually even see uh, kidney is very important in the regulation of acid. So excessive acid will be excreted. If a kidney is actually deranged, the patient will end up even having metabolic acidosis. So that, that is why sometimes we need to do even arterial blood gas analysis or ABG analysis is very, very essential in the, in the, in the investigation of acute kidney injury. So I already said about the role of stream creatinine in blood urea nitrogen. Those are very very essential and mandatory. Like if a patient, if you want to actually say whether the patient is having a care or not, they have to do at least. Like they can exempt the ultrasound, as Noor said, because of the like the fear of unknown and anxiety issues. And most people are actually this time around is discouraged to go to the hospital unless there is a mandatory, uh, like a mandatory situation that leads to uh, the visit of the hospital. <clears throat> so uh, uh, they might not do ultrasound, but they have to do serum creatinine. That one is mandatory, yeah, because they have no option. Uh, okay, uh, blood urea nitrogen. This is a difference range. Uh, I think in Kenya, uh, the most common, uh, the most common unit of measurement for serum creatinine, even even for blood urea nitrogen, is millimole. So you have to know uh, the millimole, uh, the micromole and the millimole uh, unit of measurement. Okay, hyperkalemia. What is the normal level of potassium? 
what is the normal level of potassium? Oh. Anyone? What is the normal value of potassium? Uh, Sylvia. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. uh, Venisha? I'm not sure, sir. We have not mentioned elsewhere. I think we mentioned elsewhere, but I don't 3. know. 3.5 to 5.5. Yeah, it is mostly uh, between 3.5 to 5.5. And some literature says 3.5 up to 5. But anyways, any value above 5 is, uh, we can say, is a high level of potassium. But if it is above 6, it is actually a high level of uh, potassium. OK, so uh, potassium level is very. Uh, very important. So those parameters are actually uh, very, uh, very important when a patient is having a KI. Then, uh, then uh, urinalysis is also very important so that we can actually even get uh, whether there is a damage in the glomerulus or not. Remember, uh, in normal circumstances, protein cannot be filtered in the glomerulus. I have already mentioned uh, this issues in the previous session. So uh, that means if you notice protein in the urine, like different grain, if you notice protein in the urine, we can say the patient is actually having damage in the glomerulus. So that means like there is some kind of damage in the glomerulus, like in the, this is like a pore, a pore structure like mesh. Yeah? I think you have seen about CV, sieving machine in pharmaceutics lab. So it's just like a sieve. So if there is like a uh, dilation of the basement of the glomerulus, uh, there is actually widening of uh, the mesh size of the, uh, or the size of the pore of the, uh, that glomerulus. So it allows the leakage of protein in the UA. Uh, that is why uh, in a patient who is having acute skin injury, you can actually notice positive protein in the urinalysis. So they take urine sample, they estimate the degree of protein. But mostly here in Kenya, they indicate like positive sign, like plus, mild, plus, plus, like the, the degree is higher. At the plus sign increases, the degree of severity of prote proteinuria is very high. So if you see three plus means uh, there is like high degree of uh, proteinuria. So it will give you an idea. There is actually a structural damage to the kidney. So if you see protein in the urine means there is actually structural damage in the kidney. Uh, then I already mentioned about uh, the possibility of uh, uh, like uh, blood in the urine or uh, any RBC classes in the urine. Those are indicators of glomerular damage. There is some problem in the glomerulus or uh, or bleeding in the urinary tract. So it will give you like a lot of information you need to know about the importance of urinalysis in the diagnosis of AKI. Uh, then not commonly done. Yeah, but it, it depends on my the level of the fertility. But sometimes you look at the osmolarity of the urine. I've already said uh, this one. The osmolarity of the urine is usually uh, very high in the pre-renal uh, setting, but in tra intra-renal and post-renal is less than uh, 350. So they have sometimes even they look at the fraction of uh, sodium excreted in the in the urine. So we have, I have already said even this one, like the amount of sodium excreted in the urine is very minimal, which is less than uh, 20 milliequivalent per liter in the pre-renal setting uh, because the kidney tries to retain everything as much as it can. Then I have already mentioned even in the previous lesson about the role of the specific gravity. So this specific gravity will tell you whether the kidney is actually able to concentrate urine or not. So mostly, if the specific gravity is above one means like the uh, like the kidney is like there is concentrated urine. Uh, if the uh, but in case of intrinsic and post renal AKI, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the specific gravity is usually uh, less than uh, less than one. So those are some of the most important information you need to know. 
Then sometimes even they need to do uh, urinary catheterization. So this is used to rule out any uh, urethral obstruction. So that is one mechanism. Uh, then, and not commonly then, I think some of you might then uh, might have done abdominal ultrasound. So if you order abdominal ultrasound, means it will give you like the whole picture starting from the uh, like from uh, from the uh, depend if 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 you are actually ordering the abdominal pelvic means yeah they are going to see even the pelvic organ including the bladder uterus and it see but uh, uh, if you order abdominal ultrasound it will give the whole picture of the bladder uh, sorry the the kidney the liver mainly yeah whether there is any obstruction in the bowl, okay, whether uh, the right or left kidney is actually normal. So even this procedure is not very expensive. I think not more than uh, 4,000, even the private setting. Okay, so uh, this renal ultrasound will assess the size, position, and abnormality of the kidney. Even it will actually identify whether the patient is having any kidney stone or any damage in the tubule. Okay, this is very important, especially in identification between AKI and uh, CKD. By the way, in case of AKI, as I mentioned in the definition, it is just like a, a acute decline in the kidney function. So in most of the time, the size of the kidney is becoming is a normal. There is no like structural damage at the time of the diagnosis. But if a patient is having a chronic damage, like chronic kidney disease, there was like a progressive uh, damage of the kidney and most of the time you will see the size of the kidney becomes uh, very small. So this is one mechanism to differentiate whether the patient is having AKI or uh, CKD. But I will come later, but mostly in CKD, because of progressive damage, uh, mostly they know it uh, based on uh, like the duration of the patient having that uh, chronic kidney problem is mo mostly about uh, three months. So any any persistent chronic damage above three months is usually considered as a chronic uh, kidney disease. But I have already mentioned AKI, if it is not reversed immediately, uh, the possibility of progression uh, to CKD is very, uh, very high. So you need to note. Okay, can also show any obstruction in the, in the urinary tract. Yeah, that is uh, very important, which will give you an idea whether there is an obstruction in the, in the urinary bladder. Uh, of course, uh, CT scan is also very important because it can give you detailed picture about the presence of masses in the stone. Uh, then uh, renal angiography, not common procedure. Yeah, so this shows the blood flow uh, through the kidney and even it will show whether the patient is having any thrombosis or any renal artery stenosis. It can be ruled out by renal angiography. But generally speaking, those are uh, the major, uh, the major uh, kind of tests. You can, it, it ranges identifying the serum creatinine level up to renal angiography. So still, those are the diagnostic modalities. But sometimes even uh, biopsy should be done so that they can identify whether that, uh, that problem is actually is cancer or just like a kind of microscopic evaluation of the kidney tissue. So that you can know normally what is the kind of uh, what is the kind of disease the patient is having in that area. So those are the diagnostic uh, modalities uh, we are going to consider in cases of uh, acute uh, kidney uh, disease. So uh, the most important thing is how do we prevent and how do we treat. So prevention strategies is mainly withdrawal and avoid any, any nephrotoxic agents. So any, any opening agent that has a potential to, uh, to, to cause toxicity to the patient should be withdrawn as soon as possible. Then, uh, then the next step is you will maintain adequate hydration and you actually increase renal perfusion, uh, mostly with normal saline. So what they do is normally they give normal saline, then they put catheter, so they measure the urine output, input and output. So what is the goal of therapy uh, in case of AKI? So uh, the goal of therapy is amelorating any identified 
identifiable underlying causes of AKI, uh, such as any hypovolemia, any nephrotoxic drugs from the history or from the family member, any obstructing the urethra, we need to actually identify and treat the underlying causes. But generally speaking, there is no uh, direct therapy that can revert the kidney injury. So most of the time, the treatment is just treating underlying causes. Okay, so then, uh, how do we treat? Uh, how do we treat uh, acute kidney injury? Uh, for a patient with pre-renal AKI, uh, isotonic crystalloids uh, such as normal salines are used for expansion of intravascular volume, so that we can return the fluid balance, like the proper fluid balance in the patient. Uh, this is just like fluid replacement. Then apart from that, uh, loop diuretics are actually the most commonly used drug in the management of uh, acute kidney injury because they do have a good potential to improve uh, urine output for prevention as well as for treatment of AKI. So especially if a patient is actually having a fluid overload, like volume overload, uh, due to AKI, uh, loop diuretics are a drug of choice, and those are like the dosing. 40 milligram twice daily is the starting dose. So you give last six IV twice daily, and you monitor the urine output. Okay, uh, this diagram may not be very uh, very clear, uh, but the general idea is uh, look at the creatinine clearance of and the patient. I will, let, I will show you by the how we are going to calculate the creatinine clearance of the patient in the practical setting uh, when we are discussing about CKD shortly. Uh, so uh, uh, when the creatinine clearance is uh, between uh, 25 to 75 ml per minute, uh, maybe you can use uh, IV. IV fusimide can be, uh, can be given, but anyways, uh, there is an option of oral therapy. It depends on the urgency of the condition. We can consider to give uh, to give uh, like uh, oral therapy or IV therapy. So this what guides you about the route of administration is normally the patient condition. So generally speaking, uh, this is the dosing schedule. So if the creatinine clearance is actually very very low, like less than uh, 25 ml per minute, we can actually give slightly higher doses of uh, frosimide because the kidney function is almost compromised. So after you give IV or oral therapy, the next step is you assess the patient. If the patient is hypovolemic, as a result of diuretics, you need to discontinue the diuretics. That is very important. But if it, the patient is hypovolemic, you continue the current regime uh, with monitoring. But uh, sometimes the patient becomes hypervolumic uh, despite you use uh, loop diuretics. So in that condition, you double the dose. But they mostly, for the use of plastics, you double the dose. Like you see the starting dose is mostly 40 milligram. Yeah, then you double the dose. Like, for, like 40 milligram twice daily. Then if no response, you double like 800 milligram uh, twice daily. And you monitor uh, the response. So still, uh, if it has not resolved, now this is where we are going to consider even uh, the addition of uh, uh, TSI diuretics, including metazoline, can also be uh, considered in the refractory uh, condition. So if a patient is resolved with double dose uh, of uh, loop diuretics, uh, maybe we can actually uh, consider we can actually consider uh, to continue. Uh, the same regimen. So really like there is no specific dosing uh, like uh, that is required to, to the patient but the starting is 40 then you actually uh, titrate the dose upwards uh, or downwards uh, depending on the patient response. That is the general recommendation. So uh, the first thing is uh, look at the underlying causes then you give normal saline or lasix like depending on the patient condition the cause. Then the next step is identify any electrolyte disturbances. So in case, if a patient is actually having hyperkalemia, 
we need to we need to manage the hyperkalemia because hyperkalemia can cause arrhythmia and even it can slow down the electrical activity of the heart and stop the heartbeat and the patient will end up oh, dying uh, because of cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. So that is why hyperkalemia is a medical emergency. But they, do you know uh, hyperkalemia can cause perfect death? Like if you actually continuously giving potassium chloride intravenously to the patient, you can actually kill the patient immediately. It can cause perfect death like insulin. Yes, insulin due to hypoglycemia, hyperkalemia due to cardiac arrest or arrhythmia. So the question is, uh, what do you think about the modality of uh, treatment of hyperkalemia? I think who are the group members who is uh, talking about uh, the fluid and le electrolyte in the presentation? The group members, let me know the group members. There is no group member from that group. Anyone? Samia, what is your group? Okay, huh? so tell us, how do we manage uh, Laura? Have you read about, uh, uh, have you read, have you completed the presentation? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that means at least you do have some information. Yeah. Okay. So can you tell us, please? Increase excretion of potassium. Increase the excretion of potassium. But how do we increase the excretion of potassium? Uh, it's done in three ways. Uh -huh. Okay. There is you using agents that antagonize cardiac mm -hmm. effects of hyperkalemia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Such as agents that oh for that one is okay. Maybe let me accept. Uh, there is agents that normally counteract the cardiac effect of uh, hyperkalemia. You are correct, but I will come to the yeah, drug later. Uh -huh. And then there's Cal agents that. Uh -huh. That shift potassium extracellularly to intracellular space. Okay, good. Okay, so those are the two options. Uh -huh. The third option? The ones that enhance potassium elimination. Potassium elimination. Those are like for the long term management of hyperkalemia. We call it potassium binding reasons. Okay, good. Uh, that means you have done the assignment. Huh? Okay, yeah. uh, but do we, what, what about for a refractory condition? Like if the potassium level is above seven, but the above seven is like a medical emergency. In, in that context, what do we do? No problem, T tell me, tell me the, the other, your group members. Who is your group member? I was the one doing potassium. Sorry? I was the one doing potassium. Okay, oh, you are the one who is doing potassium. So that means yeah. the other group will not know about potassium. They will, but not before Friday. Okay, okay, good. Uh, okay, good. Uh, at least you have told us uh, the most important point is how we are managing the calibia. By the uh, particular problem in a KI, uh, not only because of uh, urine excretion is reduced, but also uh, some of the intracellular potassium can be released to the serum. Then apart from that even, acidosis can aggravate hyperkalemia by provoking potassium leakage. But they, the, the major problem with acidosis is because of excessive hydrogenine, it enters to excess hydrogenine normally enters to the into the cell normally and kick out potassium uh, to the extracellular uh, fluid and increases the potassium level in the serum. But remember, the cells are very sensitive when, or, or the blood systems are, or the tissues are very sensitive when there is arrangement of electrolytes in the serum. 
specifically in the intravascular compartment. That is why when we are actually saying hyperkalemia, we are, we are saying about the potassium level in the serum, not in the cell. Because what is clinically significant is the potassium level in the serum and not in the, in the cell. Yeah, but most of the time, like damage to the tissue and any other uh, physiological effect of the electrolyte is mostly manifested when there is a change in the serum uh, potassium level. Like that is in the intramuscular compartment, not in the cell. So even acidosis can actually cause hyperkalemia. That is why when someone is having a metabolic acidosis, we need to actually uh, look at the possibility of even hyperkalemia uh, from that patient uh, because of like uh, the potassium will kick out from the cell uh, because of the effect of excess hydrogenine. So uh, the front line in the management in hyperkalemia, remember the cardiac effect of hyperkalemia is very, very serious. So it can actually even uh, cause arrhythmia and even it can stop for the heart like to beat. Because of that reason, the front line, the emergency treatment in case of hyperkalemia is give calcium gluconate. So as Laura said, uh, this one will reverse the cardiac effect of hyperkalemia. So uh, the most uh, calcium gluconate is available locally. It is like 10% injection. So you give 10 to 30 ml of calcium gluconate can be given. So in the span of like five to 10 minutes. So this one will improve myocardial stability but has no effect on the serum potassium. But remember, this one does not affect the serum potassium level, but it can actually what? It can, it can uh, reverse the cardiac effect of uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, electrolyte imbalance. So uh, the protective effect begins in a minute, but it is short-lived, although the dose can be repeated. Much, most of the time, like single dose of calcium gluconate is sufficient, but in case if there is no significant response, maybe we can repeat uh, the dose of calcium uh, gluconate and you have to know. By the management of uh, like hyperkalemia is mandatory. So you have to know, as long as kidney issues concerned, you will see those electrolytes disturbance quite often in the practical setting. So you have to know. The next step is actually a shifting potassium into the cell. As I mentioned before, uh, the, because the cardiac tissues are very sensitive for the electrolyte level in the serum, but not in the tissue, shifting potassium to the intracellular environment will be a temporary measure. So this one can be done with 50 ml of 50% glucose together with 10 units of soluble insulin over 10 minutes. But the question is, I'm going to back to uh, Laura again. So why why we use uh, uh, insulin with glucose in the context of shifting of potassium to the intracellular environment? So what is the role of glucose? Um, direct stimulation of cellular potassium uptake. Does it have a role in shifting? Does it have a significant role in shifting? But then when you are actually preparing your slides, you should be able to answer uh, those kind of questions. Why we need to combine? Does it have a role in shifting of potassium into the cell so that we can get temporarily relief from hyperkalemia? Or it is just to prevent some other issues? So what is your opinion, Laura? Um, I read it mm -hmm. lowers it lowers the effect of beta adrenergic stimulation. It lowers the effect of beta adrenergic stimulation. Yeah. So what is the benefit? Mm -hmm. I'm not What's sure. It? Okay. Uh, any other group member from this group? Any other group members? Okay. So uh, remember insulin is the principal uh, uh, treatment here because insulin activates the sodium 
potassium ATPase. So what will happen if sodium potassium is activated? Sodium will enter out, uh, sodium will be kicked out from the cell and potassium will be entered to the cell. So this is the principal mechanism how insulin is important in shifting of potassium into the cell. Yes, because of activation of sodium potassium ATPase. The role of glucose is to contract the hypoglycemic effect of insulin. Remember, insulin is very notorious in terms of causing hypoglycemia, even in normal individual. So because of this reason, if you give them insulin alone, you will kill the patient because of hypoglycemic shock. But if you combine with glucose, you can actually counteract the effect of hypoglycemia so that you can achieve uh, the desired uh, shifting. That is the role uh, of glucose in the combination treatment. So this is normally for shifting, activating sodium potassium at base. So the effect is usually apparent after 15 to 30 minutes, and it will peak after an hour, and it lasts like for three to for two to three hours. Then also, the next drug is uh, salbutamol. Sometimes you'll realize, uh, like you'll see the use of this drug is why the patient is not asthmatic. So you need to know about like the multiple indication of drug is uh, like you will see even the use of insulin. Uh, if you so uh, if you see the treatment sheet of uh, an inpatient, and if you see a prescription of insulin for non-diabetic patients, you need to find out normally why insulin is given for this patient. So this like because of hyperglycemia, is this because of other reason? So most likely it could be if you see insulin with glucose, most likely. Uh, the purpose of that treatment is for shifting. And also, salbutamol nebulizer can also be given to lower potassium. Still, salbutamol can actually activate, uh, increase the level of cyclic MP. When cyclic MP, I think MS might take you through about how beta, the mechanism of uh, beta adrenergic uh, uh, agonists, they're actually uh, G protein coupled receptor and they increase uh, the level of cyclic MP and ultimately they activate sodium potassium ATPase. So in such a way, they can increase shifting of potassium into the cell. So uh, remember, uh, those measures are not effective for all patients and do not permanently lower potassium. So as Laura said, those are temporary measures. After shifting, if uh, for chronic management, those are acute management, you give calcium gluconate, to reverse the cardiac effect because that is the urgent one, then you shift immediately with this drug. Then the next step is chronic management. If the potassium level is not actually resolving, maybe you need to increase, uh, you need to add potassium binding reason. I think that one we discuss uh, when we are discussing about uh, uh, chronic kidney uh, disease. Okay, uh, the next complication you will encounter when a patient is having AKI is acidosis. Remember, acid is excreted by the kidney, so acid is, uh, so kidney is very important for acid-based uh, balance. Yeah, but if a patient is having kidney problem, now uh, hydrogenin will not be excreted, then the patient will end up with metabolic acidosis. Then apart from that, metabolic acidosis can also contribute hyperkalemia. And most of the time, sodium bicarbonate can be useful and the treatment of acid-base uh, balance. Yeah, that is uh, uh, the role of uh, sodium bicarbonate because the bicarbonate will actually bind with hydrogenyl to actually promote elimination in the form of carbon dioxide by breathing. Okay, so uh, you can see acidosis can be given. Then apart from that, if the serum sodium and fluid overload precludes the use of sodium bicarbonate, if a, if a patient is actually a fact, Severe fluid overload, the use of sodium bicarbonate may not be good because of sodium, it actually increases uh, fluid retention. So, even it can worsen the condition. So, in extreme cases, like with the serum bicarbonate of less than uh, 10 millimole per liter, uh, maybe dialysis can be uh, considered. So, because dialysis can remove any, any, any excessive hydrogen ion uh, from the body system. Okay, so when you say dialysis means it's just artificial kidney, eh? Yeah. 
Is there anyone who came across a patient when they are undergoing dialysis? Anyone? Is there anyone who visited any dialysis unit? I will come when we are discussing about the KD. Anyone who came across a visit? Okay. Uh, the next condition we'll encounter uh, is uh, mostly uh, hypocalcemia. So what is, what is the role of uh, kidney and calcium regulation? What is the role of kidney and calcium regulation? Marion. Um, I think the kidney uh, is used to make vitamin D, to metabolize vitamin D, um, mm -hmm. which helps in calcium absorption in the GIT. Exactly. Good. So uh, remember, uh, calcium regulation is mainly done by uh, GIT, uh, parathyroid hormone, uh, and also a bone. Uh, then also uh, kidney. So the principal role of uh, kidney in calcium regulation is mainly by, uh, by activating vitamin D. So vitamin D activation usually starts from the skin uh, by the UV radiation. So uh, after that, this vitamin D will be activated in the liver first, followed by in the kidney. So the final activation of vitamin D to be useful in calcium reabsorption is uh, mediated by uh, mediated by the skin uh, because of UV radiation, uh, liver and kidney. And if it is not activated, it has no physiological effect in the body system in regulating calcium. So because of this reason, calcium malabsorption is uh, common, uh, but most most probably it is secondary to uh, disordered vitamin D. The metabolism. So uh, usually the patients are asymptomatic, but if a patient is having a hypocalcemia, it becomes tetany. Like there is actually like uh, it a tetany means like twitching of the muscle. I don't know whether uh, you have seen a patient when they are having seizure uh, in acute state. Huh? They become like twitching, huh? and sometimes even you will see they are shivering. Huh? So this is a known as tetany. Is there anyone who came across a patient with tetanus? Anyone who came across a patient with tetanus? Anyone? Okay. So uh, tetanus is actually also is characterized. Uh, uh, it has actually this feature. I have seen one patient from KNA. So that is really uh, typical. Uh, patient with uh, tetanus. Okay, uh, so uh, oral calcium supplementation uh, with uh, calcium carbonate is usually adequate in the treatment. And most of the time in this condition, we can use even vitamin D supplements because vitamin D is ultimately important for calcium reabsorption in the GIT as well as in the kidney. So and most of the time, if the patient is having hypocalcemia, we have to give uh, calcium supplement, the form of calcium carbonate or any other form uh, such as vitamin uh, vitamin D. Uh, the next condition you will encounter is uh, probably high level of phosphate. Remember, uh, kidney is very important organ in elimination of excess phosphate. So if phosphate is not eliminated in the body system, mean it can actually even deposit. Like calcium will bind with phosphate, then it can actually cause what? hyperphosphokemia, so that this uh, can deposit in soft tissues and it can actually cause a lot of issues, including even uh, kidney damage. Okay, uh, so this can occur in EKI, but rarely required treatment. By the way, it can occur in EKI, but very common in chronic uh, kidney uh, disease uh, patient. So uh, this is very common uh, in that uh, patient population. So, uh, should it become necessary to treat? If it is necessary to treat, we have to use a phosphate binding agents. So, still, the phosphate binding agents are actually mostly uh, having in the market are uh, the calcium-based uh, phosphate binder. So, 
So we give calcium uh, based preparation, calcium carbonate, so that it binds uh, with phosphate and promotes the elimination. Yes. So it's mostly, uh, it's mostly useful to retain phosphate iron in the GIT. It binds with the phosphate, dietary, uh, dietary phosphate, then it can actually promote the elimination uh, from the GIT. So this is the principal mechanism, by the way, uh, how phosphate binders are useful in the treatment of hyperphosphatemia. I think maybe those groups will give us a lot of information uh, about this condition because this is also another uh, common electrolyte disturbance in, in chronic kidney uh, patients as well. Uh, then uh, the next uh, issue is uh, about renal replacement uh, therapy. So uh, when you say renal replacement therapy, what do, you, what do you understand when you say renal replacement therapy? What does it mean when you say renal replacement therapy? Anyone? Anyone who can try? Hemod uh, dialysis, dialysis. Yes, dialysis. Okay. Uh, uh huh. So when you say renal replacement therapy means, when you say renal replacement therapy means, oh. When you say renal replacement therapy means it is indicating that the like the kidney is actually uh, totally failed. So like mostly in the severe, so this renal replacement therapy could be either dialysis or transplantation. Sorry, it could be either dialysis or uh, transplantation. So it is usually indicated in a patient with AKI when the kidney function is so poor. Uh, so that it can increase uh, the risk of a life-threatening condition. In such a scenario, uh, we need to consider renal replacement uh, therapy. So most of the time, renal replacement therapy is indicated when there is fluid overload, when there is electrolyte and acid-based disturbances. So in, in case of severe AKI, we can use intermittent hemodialysis is the most frequent renal replacement therapy. So in, K in AKI, the most common replacement therapy, a renal replacement therapy is dialysis. But in CKD, sometimes we need to consider uh, 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 even transplantation in advanced stage of uh, the disease. Okay, so uh, this is the, the indication, by the way, for renal replacement therapy, we can use uh, in acid-based disturbances, I've already said about metabolic acidosis and even electrolyte imbalances. So in case of severe hyperkalemia, intoxication, in case of even poisoning, uh, sometimes you are going to use fluid overload. Yes, we can use even in case if the patient is not responding for diuretics. In case of uremia, remember, uremia is actually having a lot of complication can cause neuropathy, encephalopathy, and if you see, it has actually a lot of complication. So those are the major indications of renal replacement uh, therapy. Then finally, how do we assess the treatment outcomes of uh, AKI? Uh, treatment outcome is mainly uh, based on uh, the vital sign. You assess uh, the vital sign of the patient then of course we need to measure uh, the weight of the patient, whether there is a change in the weight. Like if a patient was actually gaining weight because of fluid accumulation, we need to check. Then look at uh, the intake, like input and output, like the fluid intake, how much amount of fluid the patient has taken and how much was the output in the form of urine. Look at the electrolyte abnormalities, huh? blood urine nitrogen, creatinine, especially in unstable uh, patients. So those are the major information uh, we can actually monitor uh, when we are uh, treating uh, acute kidney injury. So 
Uh, this is all about acute death injury. Any any question before we proceed to the next session? Any question? Any question? Do you have any question? Okay, so uh, we can uh, we can proceed to the next session. So the next uh, session is about uh, chronic uh, kidney disease. Yes. Okay, so uh, maybe before we start the session, so what do we know about a chronic kidney failure? What do you know about chronic kidney failure? Uh, maybe Joyce. Can you say it's when they need dialysis? Okay. Uh -huh. Uh, yes, in advanced stage, uh -huh. Mombo. Mombo, can, can you tell us something? What does it mean when you say uh, chronic renal failure? Maybe excess uh, proteins in urine. Excess what? Mumbo, I didn't hear properly. Maybe can you repeat again, please? Okay, Noor. Uh, then okay, Kangai. Oh, Kangai is not connected even with audio. Okay, so who else? Injury, can you try? Um, I think in chronic renal failure, there's structural, uh like the structure of the kidney has been impaired and like the acute. Okay, the, there is a structural damage in the kidney. Okay, good. So uh, 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 this is the outlines of the presentation. So in the clinic kidney failure, this is a normally like, it's a bit broader like arrhythmia. So I'm going to take you through about the definition uh, like classifications of uh, chronic renal failure or chronic kidney disease. Uh, I'm taking some about the epidemiology. We are going to talk about uh, the possible risk factor. Then we are going to talk about the pathogenesis of this condition. Then we are going to talk about the clinical presentation of this condition, complication, investigation, management of uh, CKD. So uh, as much as possible, uh, try to be an active listener and active uh, participant in the session. So uh, kidney is uh, made up of uh, like many millions of neurons. So those neurons are like the functional unit of the kidney, uh, very important for filtering, absorbing and excreting solute and water. So the functional unit of the kidney is actually neurons. So they are responsible on this function. So uh, the problem is in case of chronic renal failure, uh, at the number of functional nephron decline, then the primary function of the kidney are, are usually affected. So the kidney is not properly reabsorbing electrolytes. The kidney is actually not properly reabsorbing, uh, sorry, uh, uh, excreting excess amount of uh, solutes and, and water. So <clears throat> the primary function of the kidney is, is production and secretion of 
erythropoietin. So this is <clears throat> the endocrine function of the kidney. And the activation of vitamin D. Remember, activation of vitamin K, the final activation of vitamin D is usually carried out in the kidney. And also regulation of fluid and electrolyte <clears throat> balance, as well as regulation of acid base balance is uh, mainly carried out in the kidney. So those are the primary uh, functions of uh, the kidney. So when you say chronic kidney disease, or it's also known as uh, chronic renal failure, it is uh, commonly defined as the presence of uh, kidney damage. So this kidney damage, or it could be defined as the presence of kidney damage or decrease in kidney function. So mostly, uh, presence of kidney damage can be detected by using the albumin uh, level in the urine. Whether there is albumin in the urine, we call it proteinuria. So this is the major mechanism. So as I mentioned before, uh, when we are discussing about uh, AKI, if you notice protein in the urine means it will give you an idea there is a damage in the, in the kidney. Uh, then uh, the, the second one is decline in the kidney function. So decline in the kidney function is uh, mostly characterized by the glomerular filtration rate. So if the GFR is uh, less than 60 ml per minute, like for three or more months, respective of the cause, uh, respective of the cause, we can say the patient is having a chronic renal failure. So uh, remember, this condition is like a progressive decline in the kidney function that can occur uh, over a period of several months to years. So that is why it is known as a chronic kidney disease. So it is also known as chronic renal uh, insufficiency, as I have said. Uh, so in summary, how do you define chronic kidney disease? In the diagnosis of chronic kidney disease, there must be either persistent damage or decrease in, in kidney function at least for three months. So this is a requirement in the, in the diagnosis. So this is very important even to distinguish AKI from CKD. So there must be a persistent damage. So that is characterized by protein in the urine or there must be decrease in the kidney function characterized by GFR of uh, less than uh, 60 ml uh, per minute. Huh? So a minimum of three months duration. So this is how we came up with the diagnosis of uh, uh, CKD. Then the most important point is how do we estimate GFR? So this is the Lester formula, uh, but not commonly employed, but this is according to the National Kidney Foundation. Like this is like the most uh, well-known international organization, which actually give a lot of information about uh, like staging diagnosis of uh, CKD. So GFR can be estimated using equation from modification of diet in renal disease study. We, we call it MDRD, modification of diet uh, for renal disease. So this is the most commonly and widely reliable estimator of uh, GFR glomerular filtration rate. So what parameter we need to know is, we need to know only the serum creatinine and the age of the patient to calculate the GFR of the patient. Okay, so this is the formula. Uh, but this time around even, you are not supposed to use, uh, like using, uh, to use your calculator to calculate the GFR. There are many applications in the Android uh, phone. Uh, if you go to normally, uh, to Android, you can get like EGFR estimator. So you just put the uh, serum creatinine and the age of the patient, and you decide whether it is a female or a, a female or male patient because of this multiplication factor. Uh, so uh, you can actually easily get the GFR in ml uh, per minute. So okay, ml per minute. That is the unit of measurement of. Uh, GFR. So this is the latest formula that can be applied. But in our setting, in our setting, by the way, uh, mostly they are using the Cockroft Gold equation in estimating creatinine clearance. By the way, there is no, when you say GFR, it is almost equivalent to 
creatine clearance. But the MDR RDF, MDR the formula is according to the National Kidney Foundation, the previous formula was reliable estimator of the renal function as compared to creatinine clearance, but there is no much difference. Due to this reason, this equation is the most commonly, the most commonly widely used formula in calculating the creatinine clearance of the patient in our setting. So uh, creatinine clearance can be calculated like age and weight and SM creatinine is very important. So if the creatinine clearance, if the uh, serum creatinine is given in milligram per deciliter, this is a formula we are going to use. 140 minus A multiplied by weight of the patient, then you add this multiplication factor if the patient is female. Then, then divided by 72 multiplied by serum creatinine in milligram per deciliter. But if a patient creatinine clearance uh, in serum creatinine is in micromole per liter, especially in our setting, so we are going to use 140 minus H times weight in kg times 1.23 times uh, 0 0.85. So the only difference is normally 1.3 multiplication factor here and 72 uh, at the bottom. Okay, uh, those are the only differences. So this is the most commonly used uh, formula uh, in our setting to estimate the creatine clearance of the patient. Okay, so what is the normal uh, GFR? Uh, according to the National Kidney Foundation, normal GFR is between 9 to 92, uh, 120 ml per minute per meter square of the patient. But still, even the normal creatinine clearance is between 90 to 120 ml per minute. That is why there is no much difference between creatinine clearance and GFR. Okay, so remember as, as the patient age, of course, the GFR will become lower because of aging. Yes. So remember even in said in, in chronic kidney patients, uh, usually the GFR is less than 60 ml per minute. Uh, those are, uh, they do have a feature of chronic kidney disease, especially if the GFR is persistently lower for months, for three months and more, even by itself, without having any damage in the kidney, we can say the patient is still have uh, chronic kidney disease. If a GFR is actually less than 50 ml per minute, this one we call it kidney failure. Like now, at this point, if the GFR is 50 ml per minute, means like kidney is totally failed. So there is a need of immediate medical attention in the form of renal replacement therapy. So renal replacement therapy at this point could be either dialysis or transplantation. So those are the two options. So this one is like the advanced stage of the disease, like the kidney function is no longer working and there is a need of artificial kidney or transplantation. Uh, when you look at <coughs> the classification of uh, chronic renal failure, uh, renal failure can be uh, classified into uh, five categories uh, based on the proteinuria as well as GFR. So stage one is mainly GFR is above 90, but there must be damage in the kidney characterized by proteinuria mostly. Okay, proteinuria or hematuria or structural damage. Then stage two is if the GFR is between 60 to 89 with proteinuria, still there should be what? Proteinuria or any hematuria which indicates there is a damage in the, in the kidney. Then stage three, uh, it has actually has 3A and 3B. Uh, 3A is like now, as I mentioned even in the previous lesson, if the GFR is actually less than 60 without having any structural damage or perspective of the causes, we can say the patient is having chronic kidney damage. So 45 to 59 is, uh, 3A and 3B is between 30 to 44. So remember, as the stage increases, 
like the the complications of uh, renal failure will be a very a very high when you say in advanced stage in advanced stage like the four uh, where this is the gfr between uh, 15 to 29 ml per minute and if the patient is actually having stage five those are renal end stage renal lesions this is also another name in the stage renal disease that means the kidney is no longer working if the gfr is actually less than 15 ml per minute it will give you an idea like the kidney is no longer working we call it kidney failure or the use suffix this d because the patient is supposed to be on dialysis okay that is the, the recommendation so this is like the standard uh, classification so a chronic renal failure so when when the patient is in stage five we call in the stage in the stage renal disease yes if you see srd abbreviation it means the patient is having in stage renal disease so you have to know uh, the next uh, the next slide is still about uh, chronic kidney disease so remember, in chronic kidney disease, there is actually a, a decline in the kidney function, and most of the time, it is reversible. So uh, any measures to treat this condition is mainly to slow down the progression to end stage renal disease. Remember, like if you diagnose the patient in stage one, two, three, and four, our aim is normally to prevent the end stage or like total failure of the kidney so the aim of treatment modality is to slow down the progression of the condition so having said this much about introductory points of ckd what is epidemiology of ckd globally it is a public health problem and the incidence or the prevalence increases as we age and it is very common in females yeah it is very common in uh, females so uh, uh, what are uh, the risk factors uh, for CKD? Okay, so what are the risk factors for CKD? What causes maladies progressive uh, damage to the kidney? Which is very, very important question. Maybe let me pause and ask you a few questions. What will be about the possible causes of uh, kidney problem or kidney damage? Tony? Tony, can you try? Okay, then. Uh, so we are Samiha. Okay, Patil. Um, hi, blood pressure. Okay, but Patil, uh, do, do you have a quiz today? Yeah? I have seen like the attendance rate is very poor today. Yeah? No. Oh, like me? Yeah? There is maybe some, I don't know, maybe people are reading for the NCM exam or I don't know what happened. Mm. I think this is the lowest number I have seen so far. Okay, high blood pressure. Uh -huh. Light issues on these sides, maybe that's why people. Is it like connection issue or? Yeah, there's power problems, I think. Power problems. Also. Yeah, I, I think so because like this class, like the maximum absence is not more than two. Like so far, like up to now, maybe it could be like power issue, like most people are not joining. Yeah? Okay. Even like my, I, I think how many times light was off even here, like around four times today. Okay. Uh, Fepan? Um, diabetes, obesity. Yes, diabetes, obesity. Yes, good. Those are the most important factor. Okay, good. Uh -huh. Any other, any other person with willing to respond? Any possible um, factor for CKD? Uh -huh. uh, autoimmune disease like systemic lupus erythematous. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, that one will cover it by the. Do you know SLE is very common in Kenya? Yeah, it's very, really, very common and. Those are like one of the major causes of 
uh, chronic uh, kidney failure is really very sad and we have seen many many cases uh, with our current kids here and the graduating class of students uh, okay sla yes autoimmune condition good okay good i think you have already said uh, some information like because of time in the next 10 minutes i will take you through about uh, some of the possible uh, risk factor for uh, ckd so remember because of the progressive nature of the disease it is uh, it is a uh, determination of the risk factor for ckd is very uh, very difficult so generally risk factor for ckd are classified into three categories the susceptibility factor initiation factor and progression factor so susceptibility factors are they are actually increase the risk of developing ckd but they are not direct causes and most of the time they are not modifiable by pharmacological molecular or lifestyle modification initiation factor more or less they are directly related to cause uh, ckd and most of them are modifiable by pharmacological uh, therapy but the progressive factors are the one that can actually enhance the progression of the disease so it can worsen the condition but still it can be modified with pharmacological therapies so what are the major susceptibility factors so those are normally they can increase the risk so age uh, maybe family history of kidney problem uh, any dyslipidemia systemic inflammation yes huh? those are some of the susceptibility factor if we look at even hyperlipidemia by the patients with ckd have a higher prevalence of dyslipidemia compared to the general population and most of the time like the total cholesterol level uh, like ldl cholesterol and total cholesterol level is usually elevated in uh, in uh, this patient population and also even uh, there is high high hdl cholesterol level in those patient population based on epidemiological studies that is why they are saying hyperlipidemia can actually increase at the possible risk so mounting evidence suggests that when the lipid profile is very high for a patient it can promote renal injury and subsequent progression of ckd so you can actually even see how a high lipid accumulation is responsible to cause a ckd when there is lipid deposition it can activate macrophages and monocytes so even it can secrete growth in factor that can stimulate cell proliferation and oxidation of lipoprotein and ultimately causes endothelial dysfunction cellular injury and fibrosis in the kidney so in summary hyperlipidemia can actually increase the risk of kidney issues then initiation factor so initiation factor as i mentioned before they are most likely related to cause ckd so currently the most well known causes of ckd is dm hypertension glomerulonephritis especially in our cases dm and hypertension are the leading causes of ckd yes the leading causes of ckd globally as well as locally so when you look at uh, even in terms of uh, prevalence like in terms of percentage it accounts about 75% of the cases of ckd so all those uh, three uh, condition accounts like around 75% of the cases of ckd but dm accounts like the highest followed by hypertension then glomerulonephritis so we can say diabetes mellitus is the most well known uh, risk factor for development of uh, chronic kidney disease that is why adequate sugar control is very uh, very important then as benisha said uh, autoimmune uh, diseases such as sla is also another initiation factor in fact if a patient is actually having sla most of the time they will develop a kidney problem at some point whatever treatment you can give because this is an autoimmune condition you cannot cure and the patient is on a long term steroids at some point they will develop kidney problem of course some drugs is okay huh? what does sle stand for systemic lupus erythematous rit systemic lupus erythematous so you can actually even google and you get the full name yes so this is a very common uh, autoimmune condition 
and which is characterized by butterfly cheeks. Uh, I think that's when we'll discuss when we reach there. And mostly, in case if this COVID era ends and if we resume the class, uh, for sure we can't miss uh, this kind of cases in public facilities. Okay, uh, then uh, some drugs can cause uh, drug toxicity. Uh, yes, we have mentioned about some uh, nephrotoxic drugs, including anti-cancer, like such as cisplatin from antifungal aminoglycosides from, uh, yes, uh, those are some of from antibiotic aminoglycosides. So you can actually mention many drugs which are the potential to cause toxicity to the kidney. Of course, Urinary tract abnormalities such as kidney infection, obstruction of any kidney stone also responsible for the patient to have a CKD. Then I will still normally like brush through, uh, but you can watch the video later uh, because we don't have sufficient time. Uh, so I have mentioned about the uh, DM is the most common uh, cause of uh, CKD. So uh, they they say uh, there is a risk of developing. A nephropathy associated with DM is closely linked to uh, hyperglycemia. So remember, hyperglycemia is uh, the most well-known causes of uh, CKD. Yeah, because uh, I will normally explain later why high sugar level is very toxic to the kidney. Then the second most common cause of CKD is hypertension. But remember, especially with hypertension, it's very hard normally like to, to determine the risk because CKD causes hypertension Hypertension can cause CKD. Because of this reason, it is really very hard to differentiate which one is the risk factor. So the only way we can know is which one was first diagnosed. If hypertension was diagnosed first, then if the patient developed a CKD, that is why I don't know whether you have noted when I was asking uh, the lady, Stasia, when she was telling her that experience, I asked her which one was diagnosed first, did the heart failure or the, the chronic uh, kidney disease? because one can cause other. Yes, in case of hypertension specifically. Uh, then uh, the prevalence of hypertension is correlated with the degree of renal dysfunction. That means at the stage of the disease increases, at the stage of the disease increases, like the possibility of having hypertension is very high. As you can see, greater than 75% of the patients with CKD with stage three, uh, actually have hypertension. So at the stage increases, like the condition, the possibility of having hypertension comorbidity is really uh, very, uh, very high. Then when you look at the progression factor, so when you look at the progression factor, uh, it can be uh, used as a predictors of uh, CKD. Uh, remember some of them, the, there is an overlapping, especially in the, in the classification. Some of them, they can be initiation. Sometimes it can be even progression. So hyperglycemia, hypertension, and proteinuria, as well as even tobacco smoking are the possible progression factor. So why proteinuria can increase the progression of the disease? Remember, as I mentioned before, if there is protein in the urine means there is some problem in the glomerulus or there is tubular dysfunction. However, the degree of proteinuria correlates with the risk of progression. So the higher the proteinuria degree, like the more the plus side, the higher the risk of progression of the disease. Okay, then what about elevated blood pressure? When the BP is elevated by the, it can cause damage of the glomerulus and ultimately decline GFR. Yes so that it can worsen the progression of the disease. So what about high blood sugar level? Why high blood sugar level increases the progression of the disease? Remember, when there is excessive glucose in the body, glucose will bind with protein and produce advanced glycation in products. We call it advanced glycosylation in products. So these end products are mainly metabolized in the proximal uh, renal uh, tubule. So when a patient is having uh, hyperglycemia, there is increased synthesis of advanced glycation products. So uh, this advanced product 
These advanced glycosylation in products are usually corresponding to increased metabolism. So the more you have advanced glycation in products, the higher the metabolism, the proximal renal tubule. So this one is said to be associated with the possibility of nephropathy in, in diabetic patients. So why sugar is very toxic to the kidney is because of the production of this in the products are, are toxic to the kidney. So nephropathy is because of these in the products. Then of course, uh, even tobacco smoking is also another pro uh, progression factor because the smoking can damage the proximal renal tubule. So the more like the more amount of the cigarette smoked by the individual, the higher the risk of the damage. That is why tobacco smoking can increase uh, progression of uh, the disease. Okay. Uh, then will you allow me to continue? Oh, we just stop and continue next time. Next time. Okay. Huh? But why don't you join on time? <laughs> okay. Okay, fine. So as much as you can, uh, please read in advance. And uh, that is my home uh, tech message. And make sure you uh, finish uh, your presentation and submit in the, in the assignment section on Black.